Well, hello and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today we have the great privilege and honor of having one of the you know first boutique pickup winders, uh, Lindy Fralin. So, Lindy, uh, today we're going to tell some of your story, and uh, we're just honored that you uh, took took the time to sit down with us. We know you're uh, extremely busy winding pickups and uh, <laughs> talking to customers and all those other things. So, so first off, thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's let's start with with how how you got into the guitar, and then we'll we'll get into how you got into winding pickups. So start with the guitar first. Sure. Well, like a lot of kids, I was into speed before I got a driver's license. All I wanted to be was a race car driver or a motorcycle driver. <laughs> but when I heard Hendrix, that all changed. <laughs> it had the same, I guess, energy as that that thrill of going fast. Yeah. So, yeah. It was, I was like about 14 or 13 when I heard Hendrix and just completely changed everything for me. And since then, I've, you know, of course, grown to appreciate the Beatles and the Stones and all the other great musicians and writers, players. Yeah. That was it for me. I had had acoustic guitar that I got out of my grandparents' attic. But, uh, you know, it was, hearing Hendrix made me want an electric. Absolutely. I wanted a white strap, but all I could come up with was a white Mustang with my paper route money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was close, at least. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I loved that guitar. Yeah. Just to sit and just stare at it when I went to bed every night. It was a sat in a corner. Never had a case. <laughs> <laughs> that is the true sign of, of guitar sickness <laughs> is when you st- and And I think we've all of us that are just, you know, you know, completely eat up with it. When we have a nice guitar or, you know, a guitar that we love, we will put it out, you know, in our room and we will look at it and have it to where when we get up in the morning, it's the first thing we see mm-hmm. is that guitar leaning in the corner. I always play some guitar within a few minutes of getting out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So the, the Mustang, I guess, was, was your first, you know, really, really good guitar. And and where'd you move on from that guitar wise? Well, I finally did get a white strap and I played the Mustang for years, about 20 years and finally gave it up to a cousin. So it's kind of still in the family. Okay. So you still know where it's at. Yeah. That's good. And it was a good guitar. The, the shorter scale, the, um, the bridge is not ideal. Okay. The whammy bar is a little too wiggly. I took my arm out of mine, but just rest my palm in that bar. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the switching is a little bit weird. If you were one of my curses is as, as I work with anything, whether it's a motorcycle, guitar, anything, my brain always goes to how can I make this better? And so after a while, the Mustang was not as good as a Strat. And I had to get a Strat. Right. Still, still to this day, if I have to have one guitar, it's going to be a Strat. Really? What's, yeah, what's... I use a whammy bar quite a bit. Yeah. What's Even the subtle stuff. I like Bixby's better, but a Strat just has all the tones. Yeah. You know, it's great guitars. What's, comfortable. <laughs> what's your best Strat? Recently, a friend made me a Cypress body. He just gave me a board. It wasn't a body yet. Yeah. And I paid someone else to make it into a Strat. I got a six pound Strat now with one of our big necks. Yeah. And, uh, I think I put a Callahan bridge on it, our vintage output split blades, and it's just unbelievable guitar. You know, good wood makes a difference between a good guitar and a truly great guitar. Yeah. Um, I know pickups are super important, but so is the guitar. (laughs) If it doesn't resonate right, you're just not going to get much out of it. So I'm I'm curious about Cypress. So would you say Cypress is closer to ash or alder or mahogany or what? what it how it was you... so light and soft. We were worried. No, I think closer to pine. Okay. Because it was so soft, we were worried to put a two stud bridge in it. We put a six screw bridge in it right. and it has not pulled those screw holes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you could dent it pretty easy. Yeah. But it just, it's really bright and really resonant. 
I've heard people having great success with pine guitars recently. Yes. Well, I haven't experimented with that. Yeah, I think people are having to experiment with that with the shortage of uh, yeah. you know, of ash. So. See, I would always pay 200 bucks just for the board to get a really light ash body. And you just can't do it anymore. It's so no. sad. But there's there's alternate woods. People will experiment and figure it out. They will. They will. And if you can make it out of pine, that's not... <laughs> There's no shortage of pine. Well, yeah, I don't think you can use any kind of pine. You have to use certain kinds. The builders know what to get. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you, Leo used a lot of pine early on before he moved on to ash. I think that the first run of Esquires were pine. Yeah. The ones that were all thinner bodies and all black. Yep. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Those are in interesting, you know, guitars to, uh, you know, I've gotten to hold one or two of them. And uh, yeah, and they're they're really light and the thinner body. It's just it's it's it feels like you're holding some kind of oddity because it's just it's it's <laughs> like a telly, but it's just the thinner body and the weight and everything. It just uh, yeah, it's different. Were those wired the without a tone control? Did they have the volume and then blender? Well, I didn't, I didn't get to plug these in, but one of them had a like a organ button on it. And an, another one, I think, had a blend control. So, and I don't know if they had been modified. Yeah, or I've, if never they were, got, yeah, yeah. I've never got to play those really early Telecasters that were volume blender. But a yeah. 53 showed up in my shop recently. And the guy wanted it converted from that, you know, dark neck pickup. Well, he couldn't get both pickups. Right. So we had to move, remove a capacitor and, and do about four solder joints on his switch. But. He says, it's my guitar. I'm going to play it. Yeah. He owns a studio. That guitar is going to get some use. It was a really sweet one. Yeah. I guess they're not all, but this was a you know six and a half pound guitar, perfectly straight neck, yeah. nice and rounded V. Those, uh, those old maple necks, you know, if they get warped, they don't want to straighten out again because it's old, old wood. So it's hard to find an, an old one that with a straight neck anymore. Well, yeah, I, I've, taken a few necks and tried to heat press them back into shape it it doesn't always work right yeah well let's so you're, you're playing guitar how, how do you get into and and you've already kind of mentioned this fact that you want to make something better or hot rod things so how does this morph into pickups oh well early on i wanted all these guitars i would see people playing in album covers or there weren't videos in the internet yet, but, you know, I would just look at the, there wasn't a Craigslist, but there was a trading post, a little magazine you got in 7-Elevens. Yeah. I would scour it the day it came out and buy whatever was cheap just to experience a different guitar. You know, for some of those K's and harmonies were super cheap, silver tones. Uh, I never got lucky and found a vintage guitar cheap, but yeah. every now and then somebody would. Richmond, Virginia doesn't, didn't have a lot of vintage guitar surface over the decades. <laughs> but uh, I would play them and then try, you know, I'd, sometimes I'd get them because they didn't work right. I just had, so I slowly learned how to adjust them and then modify them. But first it was just make them play. You know, if I decided I didn't like it so much, I sold it. But I guess wanted to experience all these different guitars. And you know, things like 6120 Gretsch didn't show up. but yeah, I, I I would try anything if it was cheap. <laughs> Learn how to make it a little bit better. Uh, at some point, I read an article that Danny Gatton was winding his own pickups, and I talked to a friend, a local Richmond guy named Keith Gress, and he had built himself a winding machine, like a dentist drill motor and a foot and a little jig to hold one pickup at a time. And I went and bought it sewing machine motor and pedal and made a simple winding machine, which I still have. <laughs> and I, you know, I just fiddled with it for fun. And at, at some point in there, I kind of started doing basic guitar repairs, just real simple stuff. I don't think I was ever a good repairman, but I could adjust a guitar and maybe install pickups or tune it or intonate it. Or I did a few fret jobs. I don't think I was very good at that either. <laughs> <laughs> you have to practice that stuff to be a master at it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's dif difficult stuff. I, you know. Oh yeah, it's attention to detail. But I, you know, I just gradually learn more and more about guitars. 
once I started uh, having a little bit of success winding them, which is all strats at that point, this was back to when you could go in a music store and my band would, would travel some and I'd always hit the local music stores and just say, you got any old parts. They'd open a drawer and say, yeah, 50 bucks for the whole drawer. <laughs> yeah. There'd be tuning machines, old pickups, some working, some not. And so I, you know, I didn't have any real money. I couldn't, I didn't tool up for my own parts until the nineties, but I was doing rewinds for about five years commercially you know, I put an ad in a magazine or two. And every time I had to rewind a new pickup, I'd learn more about how they work, the different designs. But not always listen to them, just hold them over the strings and listen to them. So it was all a real gradual process to get into all of this. So what what kills a pickup that it uh, you know so that you would of course necessitate a, a rewind? What kills well, pickups? If no one messes with it. It's usually just corrosion. Okay. Sweat, age, humidity. Um, the wire is thin as your hair. Right. The, the insulation on it's about a ten thousand stick of painted on insulation. So if you if you sweat on your guitar, it's going to age metal. Most of the yeah. time, though, yeah, the rest of the pickup was the parts are still reusable. So it, it was it was a pretty easy to rewind a lot of them. Yeah. Some of the harder ones we still refuse to take in now, but. Foxes, Hagstroms, Framus, they were all glued together in a way you couldn't get them apart very well. Right. Would um, I guess so so early on, because you weren't having to to get your own parts, you were doing more rewinds and and again, you were taking these pickups that you were buying while you were out on tour that were dead. And uh and so describe the the rewinding process because I guess there's there's more to it than just pulling pulling the wire off and putting new wire on there. Yeah, I did peel a few to see how it was layered, thinking there might be some magic there. Um, that takes about two and a half hours, so didn't do very many. I would yeah. learn, but I also always peel a valuable pickup nowadays just to see if it can be repaired. Because one way they could die is if it's been out of the guitar, it could have been nicked on the outside. So it's worth peeling a layer or two off most rewinds. Um, especially fenders, because once they're out of that plastic cover, they're exposed. Right. And if if something nicked the wire, then you can often repair those. A typical Strat has eight or 9,000 turns on it, so it can miss 50 or 100 and still be a perfectly good pickup. Yeah, and still have all the original wire on it and such. Yes. Yeah, if, yeah especially with the value of these instruments. When I first started out doing this, a a 50 strat was a thousand bucks. And now what are they? 50,000? I don't even know. Yeah, yes. I don't buy and sell instruments. It's yeah. Beyond my capabilities. <laughs> yeah. So you were, so in, in the rewind process, do you have to, like, if it has corrosion and stuff, do you have to clean the, the magnets yeah. and the bobbin and stuff like that? Or Yeah. Often fenders or the top plate has started to warp up because when they put them together, they just dipped them in lacquer, and that was the only glue. A fender pickup is basically six magnets with a top and bottom plate of fiberboard. Yeah. Fiberboard is just paper made out of cut. So these things are they're durable, but they're they're fragile and they will absorb moisture. So typically, there's actually a video. So if anybody wants to go watch it on our website about the whole process from beginning to end of a rewind. But yeah. We'll try to diagnose it, yeah. figure out why it's not working, then make a drawing so we can put it all back together later. It might be a week later when I actually wind it. And um, so I'll have wire. I'll have which way the magnets go, you know, what color leads were on it, everything on a little drawing. And then, yes, I typically take the magnets out. Often they're covered with rust yeah, because they're exposed. And, uh, you know, we wire wheel that rust off. I bought a custom made uh, tap that's about five thousands bigger than those holes. It's just threads that we thread into those holes to kind of score them because they're shiny when the magnet comes out. And that it actually makes the hole about a thousandths or two tighter. And let's we crazy glue them together too. I don't just dip them in lacquer. So we're making these things strong again. Yeah. So once you cleaned it, glued it back together, 
we'll often spray it with lacquer again because you have to coat those magnets. And then wind it. You know, we know the right amount of turns. Often I'll talk to a customer, though, because old ones, the, the number of turns it went on was really random. Right. I don't believe they had the machinery to accurately count turns. So they're all over the place. And I'll ask the customer, what do you want it to sound like? Because there's a real range, on, in, as an example, tele pickups. I've repaired them at anywhere from mid fives to 11K. There's so much range. PAFs are everywhere from 7.2 to 9. You know, there's, there's just a lot of range back then. So, so go ahead. We put the right amount of turns on it to get the, you know, the power someone wants. Because in general, this is universal. More wire on any pickup is thicker mids, a little bit louder, and darker. And less wire is more open, airy, sparkly. Give me one second. Sure. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, then we, we, we put an X amount of turns on it. Uh, and... Um, then the, pro the next is uh, putting the leads on and wax it all. Yeah. Fender wax most of their pickups. Some they dip the lacquer and some they, but we like wax better because lacquer makes it harder to peel them and repair them. Right. Whereas wax is super soft and it protects it, it penetrates all the way in and lacquer doesn't. I yeah. much prefer wax. Yeah, I, I have some... I have a, a 67 telly that uh, it was, you know, lacquer potted and it had to be uh, rewound and, and, you know, and, and dipped in wax. Cause it was the, 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 yeah, the lacquer doesn't protect it very well. It flakes off yeah, and such. It coats it, but it doesn't penetrate. Uh, I have to close the door. Now. Sure. I had to let the dog in and out. <laughs> the dog's great. So, so how do you uh, how did the transition happen between rewinding and then making your own pickups? And of course, you have the problem of getting uh, you know the the raw you know the the not just the wire but the bobbins and the magnets and all these things. So that's you know, right. to, and there's no internet. Yeah, back then there was no internet. If you wanted to find suppliers, you looked at, went to the public library and found the Thomas Register. Yes. Which is the equivalent of a yellow pages for the whole country. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, uh, after about five years of doing rewinds, I, you know, I saved up enough money, researched how to make, how to get tooling because you couldn't buy this stuff yet. And um, so I, I bought the two tools to, to stamp out strap parts, figured out, you know, basically just copy what Fender did. And yeah. um, so for about three years, we made strats only. And then uh, once we had a little bit of money, we just added tellies to the line. Yeah. And somewhere in the mid nineties, you could start buying uh, like P90 parts from all parts or humbucker parts from all parts. And so early on, I did that. Now I own my own tools, my own injection molds yeah. for, and stamping tools for the base plate. Uh, this was all before laser cutting and CNC. So I, I did mine the old fashioned way. Nowadays, if you wanted to make your parts laser cut, you wouldn't have to own this expensive tool. But then each part costs more. The stamping right. tools in the long run are cheaper because each part's cheaper than cutting them out one at a time with a laser cutter. Yeah. But yeah, we added a pickup at a time. And, um, you know, in the last two decades we've really come up with some of our own designs instead of just copying fender and gibson right and you've had like the the split coil you know uh, humbucking yeah. strat pickup you've got your hum canceling p90s you've got uh you know a, a variety of of, of your yeah, own a lot designs. of this hum canceling stuff is just customer demand yeah do you make a hum canceling this or that and yeah my favorite designs for home canceling is most of the time the left and right design like a P base was done. Right. Because they don't, it doesn't hurt the sound to do it that way. The yeah. stacked pickup just never sounds right to me. Yeah. And as much, even if they sound good, they don't feel right. They don't respond to your touch the same way as a single coil. But I don't hear any, uh, 
anything wrong with the sound of the left and right design. So we have come up with a lot of those. Split jazz bass, split 51 P bass. The earliest version of a split strat was the Twang Master. Right. I worked on that in the early 90s with uh, Paul Reed Smith, part of a three man crew designing that pickup. And, um, but he put it in a unique cover. So when we sell them, they're in a humbucker cover. And we called it a Twang Master. But yeah, that's a totally Fender sound in a humbucker cover, no, no hum. Yeah. Now, the split blade was the only way to get it in a strat sized shape. You really can't do that with six Alnico rods. It just, they have to be offset because you can't get enough wire on them otherwise. Yeah. We did the P92, which is a split P90. Yeah, that, that's my favorite design. And I'm re, and what we're working on now to come out with soon is a, a split five string jazz bass. Wow. Because there's no way to split it like the four string with just Alnico rods. And I, again, I don't like stacked pickups very much. Yeah. Stacked so that's pickup. in the prototyping stage right now. Yeah. So it, your original offerings were, were Strat pickups. That would, would that have been like the vintage style and like the blue special or the hot? What, what would that have been? At first it was just vintage hots. Okay. And then, uh, because you can't get but so much wire of 42 heavy form bar on there. It's hard to get much above like 6.8. Okay. okay. And I, uh, I found a wire that lets me push them up into the mid sevens. And that's became the blue special. Okay. First, we just called them five overs for years. And we gave them a name so that it'd be easier to market it. Cause that about that time, I guess there was a rudimentary internet. Yeah. We had a crude website. That, before the internet was taken over by commercials, it was it was really useful. People would chat with each other and spread information around. And it's it's become something I'm not very fond of, the internet. I don't yeah. spend much time on it anymore. You know, we declined to have ads on our YouTube videos forever. And now they're on there anyway. I'm not getting paid. Right. <laughs> it's the kind of stuff the internet's just all about money now. <laughs> yeah, they've uh, YouTube has uh, doesn't ma matter whether you monetize your videos or not. They're going to. They're yeah, gonna, they're going to get their money. If they keep it to four seconds, I'd be can't complain. You know, they're it's cost them a fortune in servers. So <laughs> yeah. So and and how did the uh, so after the the strats were, were the tele tele pickups next or what yeah. was next? I picked them because I thought I could sell the most of them. You know, early on, I was a big fan of Dan Electro's, and I looked into making that pickup. But that would have been five times the tooling investment as a strap. Yeah. Because those covers weren't available anymore. The magnets were special and all these different metal parts. So, yeah, we, we have based our earliest offerings on what I thought I could sell the most for my investment. Strats and tellies were definitely first. Yeah. And then somewhere in the mid nineties, like I said, you could get P90 parts or humbucker parts from all parts. So our earlier offerings were just all parts parts. And uh, I liked, uh, I, I got my own tools so that I could get the spacing exactly right. Cause you know, all parts P90 Bob is 50 millimeter. And old Gibson's were more 49.2. They, they weren't millimeters. They were, right. Whatever they were, one in fifteen sixteens, I think. <laughs> so let's take for example your your Telecaster pickups again. Um, like you have the vintage and and the blue special. Were those based on specific pickups that you had that you had messed with, or were they just you experimenting? Or yeah, you because know, experimenting. You know, I always put stuff in my own guitars when we play them at gigs and. Um, it, at first, it's tempting to make pickups as hot as you can, but you realize they don't sound good past a certain point. So the Blue Special, whether it's Strat or Tellys, they use the same magnets and the same amount of turns are to my ears as loud as I can make a Fender pickup that still has bright wound strings. Yeah. You go much past 7K, you're going to get a kind of a clogged up wound string and it doesn't sound very good anymore. Yeah. Unless you play distorted all night. We'll do hotter pickups if people ask for it. 
But that's been a real popular model because they do sound good and they're fairly strong. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask, what, what are your, uh, what are your best sellers? Oh, um, strats and tellies. It's the either stock or vintage hot. Yeah. Blue specials. Yeah. Because some people want the open, airy, sparkly sound of the real traditional ones. That's more like the stock output or vintage yeah. hots. And the blues special is a good all-around guitar if you're playing more than just country or, you know, like police or, or pretenders. Those are not powerful pickups. They're real clear. Yeah. Strumming chords like that. And what pickup are you the most proud uh, of? The, the one you're the most happy with? Well, I like our split blades. I use them all the time. And my um, my newest guitar I just had built is a, our version of the Dearmand. I, uh, I, I tooled up so that I could have that cover. Right. The top plate, the base plate. So we, we now offer Dearmands in either a screw version, it's more like a P90, or the Alnico version. It sounds like a vintage Dearmand with no hum. Wow. I play a kind of a fake Gretsch nowadays at a lot of gigs. I also love our pure PAX. I have a guitar right here I brought as a prop. It's a commissioned fake Les Paul, with low output pure PAFs, and a, this, I think it's Mojo X makes this bridge that's stealth intonated. They sound so good. It's pure, just solid aluminum, no moving parts. <laughs> this yeah. guitar is insane. When I gave it Oh, go ahead. I was going to say the wraparound tailpiece. It has it has its own sound. It's it. I, I agree. I think it sounds better than the uh, the stop tail plus two pneumatic. Just well, it's it's as rigid as a telly. You know, telly yeah. sounds so good. I think because of all that down pressure on three brass saddles, the strings right. ending in wood. This has that same kind of sustain when you strum it acoustically. Yeah. Just love this guitar. Um, and I of course gave it. Uh, partial coil taps for each pickup. Partial which coil I, taps. Which means I tap through a resistor. Okay. And then it has a master volume and blender pot instead of two volumes and two tones. The blender pot's a push-pull phase reverse, so I've got a lot of sounds out of this guitar. <laughs> yeah, you can cover, you know, I guess some more single coilish things or maybe the the T-bone, you know, yeah. Walker kind of, you know, out of Peter phase Green, stuff. Peter Green, Walker, yeah, Peter that's Green. that out yeah. of phase sound. Um, and uh, for, for clean rhythms, the partial coil tap works real well because it just brightens the wound strings. Right. But by doing it through a resistor, you go, instead of to half output, you keep about two thirds of the pickups output. Not which, as bad at drop in power. Yeah, which makes it a lot more usable than, you know, when all of a sudden to get a clearer sound, you lose, you know, almost half your output. Yeah. Well, for a decade, I made an unbucker. And uh, that was just mismatched coils. But we purposely put more wire in the screw coil. But they hum. And so this, this idea came to me electronically, just tap through a resistor. Yeah. So again, I don't so think it's, I'm it, the first one to think of it too. I yeah. I know 25 years ago, Seymour Duncan had a suggested wiring where he used like your tone control to tap your humbuckers, and it worked. Yeah, I don't even remember how it worked, but it it did. <laughs> so again, by by saying that you're tapping the output, not in the fact that you're 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 tapping it from from a, another point in the windings, but you're just using a resistor to. Mm -hmm. uh, to change the the tone of it, so you're you're yeah you're just bringing a resistor into the circuit, correct? Well, I'm using that center wire where the coils go in series. Right. A traditional coil splitting or tapping, I use the terms interchangeably, which I know upsets some people. <laughs> uh, is just getting rid of half your pickup. Right. You ground that center wire, and you get rid of the slug coil. But if you tap through a resistor, there's still some small amount from the slug coil. Okay. That's, that's how it keeps from dropping to half output. Because okay. half output can sound a little wimpy to most people. Yeah. Unless it's a really strong pickup. Of course, there's always that too. I like these lower output pickups. This particular guitar is only 7 6 neck, 8 4 bridge. Pure PAFs are our kind of low wind, or they're really a very traditional. That's not low. 
for PAFs, that's low for modern pickups. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. You know, the, uh, you know, old PAFs weren't wound as hot. Uh, you know, starting with like the super distortion <clears throat> and other pickups in the in the seventies, it became the, the norm where you know people were selling all these humbuckers that were really really high output. So yeah. the JB and others. So so that worked on a lot of the amps we all had back then. But today we have probably the best amps and the best pedals we've ever had access to, or at least yeah. the most variety. So. You don't need a really hot pickup as much. Yeah. Tell us about the, uh, there was a Lindy Fralin amp. Is that still offered? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a one-man shop up in Waldorf, Maryland. Jim Hill makes them. And uh, that project started because I no longer wanted to bring my black Vibroverb or black face Vibrolux reverb to gigs yeah. anymore. But I wanted a lightweight amp that could, be, you know, this this thing ended up being about 34 watts into a 15 cathode bias. So it's kind of a hybrid between a black fiber verb and a 52 tweed pro. Was right. there cathode bias in 15? It's six L6s. We kept it light by leaving the tremolo out, but it does have reverb. Yeah. It's a sweet amp. It, it's still a little loud. I gig a lot with a Princeton these days. Yeah. So, and I guess Everybody I guess you're talking we're still too loud. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say Princeton, are you talking about like silver face, black face, or brown? I have three, and only one of them's real. The other okay. two are kits. So one okay. of them's a black face, mid sixties. Yeah. I've had it for thirty years. That poor amp's been modified and dogged, and I'm sure it's a new grill cloth and baffle board. It's got a mid boost somewhere in the back. <laughs> it's had so many speakers I couldn't tell you <laughs> I've owned it a long time early on I had no respect for vintage instruments they weren't that valuable yet so I would I own two ES225s that were one pickup when they were made and now they're three <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you wouldn't do that today but 25 years ago I wouldn't think twice about it yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you're gigging, what what do you take with you? Well, I almost always have a Stratotelli. Lately, I've been using the the uh, sixty one twenty style Gretsch, and taking this Les Paul to gigs too. Yeah. I just really like the way this thing plays and sounds. This is a local builder named Tommy Rodriguez, um, and he'll build. Can you see that headstock? Yes. He'll build anything I want. He did at least six things different from a real one on this. Like he believes in this headstock angle being only 10 degrees. He let me shape the neck. He put a belly cut. Yeah. Plus he relocated the knobs and, and this thing. And he managed to keep this guitar at eight pounds without chambering. He just really carefully selected the wood. So I, I've become a real fan of custom builders. Yeah. That's a, I, a when I built my Flying V, I did the same thing. I made the headstock a half inch shorter, the wings three quarters of an inch shorter. I relocated the knobs, put a Bigsby sunk into the front because I don't I don't want a roller on my Bigsby. Yeah. So to get the right down angle, I had to kind of sink it into the body. Yeah, yeah. The down angle is very very important. It, uh, people don't realize how much difference it makes when. You know, depending on how high a strat or telly sits in the neck pocket, how high the the saddles have to come up, and all all those brake angles mm -hmm. and, and change how the tension and how the, the feel of the instrument. Well, a, a big speed, you know, almost forces you on these Gibsons to have a shallow angle. So right. That's why we just sunk it in the body a quarter inch to get a, an acceptable angle there. But like, right. I tend to play hard sometimes. Yeah, I don't want to be knocking those strings out of the saddle. Yeah. So you'd have one of these instruments, you'd have a Princeton. Do you use any pedals when you, when you get? Oh yeah. I have three pedal boards. I, I use them sparingly, but I always have to have a tuner. Yeah. <laughs> and my, a lot of amps don't have tremolo like that Fralin VVT. So I'll have a tremolo pedal. I got the Flint, which I like. Strapping yeah. is good stuff. Yeah. If I'm playing a little tweed deluxe, I've got reverb in that Flint pedal. Yeah. I always use a delay, some kind of overdrive, a tuner. And a tremolo. And, good, um, good basics. Yeah. 
it's oh, it's fun. And it's one of the pedal boards. If I'm playing dirty or I have a, a Pigtronics, what's that thing called? An area, which is actually a distortion, not an overdrive. And it's it's a nice pedal. Okay, a customer calls you up on the phone and uh, they, they start asking, you know, questions about what pickup I should put in my guitar. What do you wish customers knew about pickups? What is the, the greatest misnomer or myth or thing that you wish you could, uh, you know, that you wish people knew? Oh, I would love it if they'd read our website and know what their choices are in advance. Because yeah. you're right, sometimes it, it's frustrating when a guy tells me his amp collection and what color his guitar is and how rare it is. And then names 10 kinds of music, ska, blue, reggae, jazz, country, heavy metal. What pickup do I need? Yeah. I have no idea at that point. And I've listened to a minute or two of all this stuff. What they mostly need to know is how much power do they want? If there's a range between a really clear telly and a really strong telly, where in that range do you want to be? You want the thicker sound that's quicker to get dirty or the more open sound that you can play chords without distortion. So uh, that's, that's the questions I ask is what do you want this guitar to do? Do you need hump cancer or is it not important to you? Yeah. It was never important to me. My band plays bars and parties, but a lot of people play in front of a computer or uh, or, you know, they accompany a quiet vocalist or something they can't have home. Right. Just don't want it. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people play in environments where they're using like in-ear monitors and such with a band. And, and in those situations, the hum is right in everyone's face. So so true. <laughs> One day I'll get to that. Uh, yeah, we're we play such quiet little gigs right now. We literally use those little hot spots for monitors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, I haven't gotten into in ear monitoring yet, but yeah, you, you know, it's <laughs> I, I wish I wish it wasn't there. I'm starting to sound like an old man now. But well, it's state yeah. of the art. I mean, it's yeah. I'm sure it's better and it's saving people's ears. Mine are already shot. Yeah. Between playing in bars for 40 years, I've, I own motorcycles, I've owned convertibles. So I've probably ruined my hearing. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you've, uh, you know, so you, you've you got this, uh, this you, I'm really interested in these. Uh, so how are you able to take uh, like the DeArmond type pickup? How are you making that home canceling? It's like our home canceling P90 in that there's a row of pole pieces and then two sideways coils picking okay. up the signal. So okay. we basically got, um, I mean, the, the single coil sound comes from picking up the string at one point. So there's hum canceling designs that still sound like single coils. And a good example is a precision bass. Right. That's the left and right design. This is sideways coils. It's, uh, if you go all the way back to the 50s, Seth Lover invented this idea for the EBO basses. But they were very muddy. And if you're fiddling with a design for you know, prototyping it for a few years, the first sideways coil pickup we came out with was the hum canceling P90. Yeah. And I kept them bright. I figured out how to make it sound like a, re a real P90. And uh, then the, the Alnico in the middle was uh, just my idea. I, know, I said, I know this will work. I made some prototypes. And since injection molds are very expensive, I made sure it fit a jazz master, a DeArmon, a humbucker, a soap bar, and a dog ear. Yeah. <laughs> we use all those covers to say, okay, the width is determined by DeArmon, the height by dog ear, the, this dimension by a humbucker. And um, so there's one injection mold that I can fit in all those covers and wind it various ways, but it's two sideways coils on our outside a row of Alnico rods. Yeah. So they're active. It's not a stack. <laughs> yeah. Both clothes active. So what challenges do you face as far as supplies? Like, you know, you, you said that you had, uh, you know, injection molding, but is it, is it difficult getting the, the wire and, and the magnets that, that so you want to use? We've been exceedingly lucky. 
our uh, the wires meet in America, and so are our alnico rod magnets, um, our bar magnets for humbuckers. And even when I buy Asian material, I buy it through our American company because there's still one company making alnico for us, Arnold. Yeah. And um, the supply problems we've had are more things like uh, the covers. The companies who make our covers, Advanced Plating and National, has had trouble getting nickel silver. Yeah. And they all need some, you know, base plate made like the Diarmid. It took him a year to get nickel silver for the base plate of our Diarmid pickup because that's a unique part. I had to buy a stamping tool and order yeah. boxes. So a lot of things take forever. And right now, that's a problem delaying our five string split jazz pickup. It's just these days, things take forever to come to you. We've been lucky that we never have our supplies on that last minute, like the auto industry. What's killing them is they didn't want to stock six months worth of chips. They wanted them all delivered the week of. Right. <laughs> and they're, yeah. they're having to shut down assembly lines. Yeah. When we um, buy stuff, I buy two years worth. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I store a lot. Yeah. We have not run out of Alnico ever because I keep at least four or six months of material around. Yeah. I was, uh, I was recently uh, rereading the, uh, the Forrest White book, uh, like Inside Fender, you know, the Fender, the Inside Story. And he was telling about how when he came to the factory in the 50s that they were they were waiting to order until they got to the bottom of the box. So <laughs> when there's a couple left, that's when we'll order. <laughs> well, our our system, we're updating it and finally getting it both computerized so you can look at all your inventory on the screen. But yeah, we always had you know four boxes of screws and one right we wrote last box on it, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Or whatever we were buying. Um, so it's it. We're getting better at that, but we rarely run out of stuff. It's mostly been metal parts this year. Yeah. But we're lucky. Our wire is also made in America and it never, they've never said we can't ship it. We, we've always been able to get it. Yeah. Um, so some, some commodities aren't, aren't as affected as like plywood or chips for cars. Yeah. You know, over the the last you know year and a half, you know it's been a you know a lot of a lot of change, a lot of challenges, and but also an opportunity for growth. How how have you grown, or what have you learned over the past year and a half? Hmm. Well, we just, we're only a ten man shop, and at the beginning of this COVID, we lost four people, not to sickness, just had to, one had to go home and homeschool his kids, and another one lost his daycare. Right. One kind of freaked out. We never saw him again. Three of them have come back part time, but we've been short staffed the whole time. So, it, and business did not go down really. It stayed fairly level for us. I guess they shut down the music stores, but online sales went up. Right. So for the first time since the whole pandemic started, I hired someone two weeks ago because now everybody's vaccinated and feeling like it's okay to do. Yeah. For the longest time, there was no way I could bring someone new into the shop because we all wear a mask even when we talk to each other. It's Luckily, my, my shop, everyone has their own room surrounding one big central room. So we could be without a mask in our own rooms. And we got away with it. No one I know got sick. Well, that's fantastic. But Richmond didn't have the hot spots like you know Brooklyn did or lots of places around the country. Yeah. Well, Lindy, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me and and uh, and very, you know, fantastic to get to hear, uh, you know, just kind of how you come up with designs and the challenges you've run into and how, how you got into pickups. So <laughs> thank you so much. Well, and, uh, yeah, it was it was a real treat. Well, nice to meet you. And thanks. All right. Well, bye bye. Take care. Bye.